heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from New York and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, tech stocks lead the markets to new highs. We discuss the drivers from the elections to earnings and the Fed. And we talk chip demand as Arm and Qualcomm give mixed signals about the smartphone market. We speak to Arm's CEO, Rene Haas. And the C-suite take on the election. We speak with Andrews Palmer-Lucky amid a focus on defense tech. But first, let's just get back to these publicly traded markets that are at new record highs. I shine a light on the Nasdaq 100. It finally reaches that new record yesterday, eclipsing the number it got to back in July. We're at 1.3%. The likely magnificent sevens drive this benchmark to yet further heights ahead of the Fed. What are you watching, Ed? Earnings, but November 5th, an astonishing day to report numbers, right? Lyft is up 27%. Off session highs where it was up 30%. Strong outlook. They're kind of finding their niche and growth despite big brother Uber also doing well. Then there's the chip names, Qualcomm and Arm. They've traded very choppy in the session. Qualcomm was up a lot, now it's up eight tenths of a percent. Arm was down, it's now up five and a half percent. Basically, consumers in key markets like China buying higher priced handsets and both benefiting from that, but we can get into it later in the program. We can, and of course, China, a key focus for the macro perspective going forward after the results of the election came through. Let's get an overview of these markets of Bloomberg's Jess Menton. Jess, we see big tech leading all the benchmarks to new highs, as well as small caps, but what keeps your eye? Well, the big thing, because y'all just touched on when it comes to earnings, so the biggest player obviously will have NVIDIA coming up on November 20th. But when you look more specifically at when it comes to some of its biggest customers, we've already had those earnings when it comes to Meta, Microsoft, Alphabet, as well as Amazon. So when it comes to as far as what in totality, when it comes to what they're plowing into data center businesses, as well as other fixed assets, I mean, it's around $59 billion uh, with those four companies just in the third quarter alone. So usually that you can kind of glean into what that means for NVIDIA moving forward. But obviously, on the back of these election results, there's a lot of questions as far as what this could potentially mean for Biden's chip act, especially when you think about companies that derive different manufacturing from overseas like Apple, as well as when it comes to, say, China and Biden trying to prohibit them trying to use Western technology and trying to curb that right now, Caroline. The, the, the headline of the BN story today is NVIDIA is clear winner in a lackluster big tech earnings season. Is, is anyone watching this show? It's been great. Um, <laughs> Caroline, I've had a lot of fun. I think the main point is that whatever happens in this next administration, Jess, it doesn't kick in for a while. Is there like a theme of the now, of the next three months, final three months of the year that markets are looking to? Well, usually the playbook in an election year is typically once you have the election results, there tends to be a year-end rally. But we had quite a bit of a rally, not even just when you're thinking about what's happened in tech and growth stocks, but the first three quarters of this year was the best start to a year for the S&P 500 since 1997, but the Magnificent 7 didn't really contribute to that in the third quarter. Obviously, we've seen a bounce back from that, but even when we heard from Microsoft and Meta's results in recent weeks, on the back of that, we didn't really see those stocks pop, but obviously sort of all tied kind of lifting bolts here over the last couple of days following those election results, but moving forward, it's whether or not we see that playbook, and especially the positioning play out in the final months of the year like we normally would through history. Bloomberg's Jess Menton helping us make sense of tech in markets. Thank you very much. So what does Trump 2.0 presidency look like for the tech sector? Dan Ives of Wedbush writes, we expect a strong AI focus out of the gates from Trump for US big tech players, Khan out of the FTC and Musk's big bet on Trump being a home run for Tesla. Dan Ives joins us now. Dan, Regular viewers of this show and network will know that much of what I just read out is not a surprise, this, that you have this thesis. But let's start on the AI part. What gives you such conviction that Trump will focus on AI out of the gate? I, I mean, I think that that's going to be a huge focus within the government. I mean, government's been way behind when it comes to AI. That's going to be huge initiatives, I think, through DOD, through the agencies. That's going to be bullish for Microsoft, bullish for Amazon, bullish for Google, 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 Google names like Palantir. I think that's right. other names that are going to benefit here in what is a golden age for AI. 
and Palantir, there's the link with government. I want to ask you about Elon Musk. And if you'll allow me, let me just put it this way, because the market tried to make sense of the Tesla move. It's believed that Trump will repeal some or all of what's legislated for on the EV consumer incentive side, manufacturing support for the companies themselves. There's the association tailwind between Musk and Trump. Why is it that Tesla survives and stands out to your mind, but GM, Ford, Rivian, names like that won't do as well? Sure. I, I think it's a great point. Let's go two parts. One, by removing the, the credits, the 7,500, that's going to give much more even playing field. I mean, Tesla has a scale and scope. They're going to be hugely advantaged there versus the Detroit stalwarts. So that's bullish there in terms of the giving them that availability and I think option, you know, to ultimately they could still cut prices more. But the big thing, the reason that this stock, I believe it's a trillion dollars of value unlocked when it comes to the AI piece, because when you look at Trump now, this is going to give the highway, the auto bond for autonomous. I think he is going to fast track autonomous FSD. That is very bullish for Tesla. And it comes down to when it from Musk, one of the best strategic bets he ever made was ultimately this bet on Trump. Is the technology ready? I think the technology is not maybe not necessarily ready today in its current form, but it's going to a point that this is ultimately going to be when I look at autonomous and FSD, it's a trillion dollar incremental valuation. You could cyber cabs, you could ultimately see 2026, 2027 initiatives get fast track. Tesla Musk is the big winner in this call at Trump sweepstakes, along with big tech. Because the other view is, is that Khan is likely going to be out at the FTC, and that's bullish for deal making mm. across big tech. Okay, there's a lot to be bullish about, but one area of concern has been well, yes, AI will be fueled, but what about the infrastructure for AI? A lot of that comes with growing chip sector here sure. in the United States, and that's dependent on. Well, in many ways, the CHIPS Act. Yeah. Maybe that gets blown out of the water. Yeah, so I think when it comes to CHIPS Act or Inflation Reduction Act, clearly there's going to be a lot of revisions there. I view probably the biggest loser and negative would be names like Intel, you know, just adding to, to that pain. But from a chip perspective... You think Intel will be a loser there? Well, first, I think Intel's been a loser. This is just putting, really, adding gasoline to the fire in terms of... IRA was really going to be a huge opportunity for Intel. I think Intel now is on the wrong side of that trend. I think what you're going to see with IRA and Inflation Reduction Act, much more focus on chips in the U.S., but really much more focus on the AI build-out. And I think when it comes to some of the tariffs that we talk about with China, I think there will be carve-outs. That's why I don't think that NVIDIA is going to be so negatively impacted. I don't think a lot of these other names in terms of the tariffs, I think Tesla, Apple, that's also why it's so important that Musk is going to be a whisper in the White House. I'm just going to let you put your IFB back on um, because I know Ed wants to jump in here. But I'm interested in... Basically, you think Trump isn't going to live up to a lot of the things he promised on the campaign. I think Barr's going to be a lot worse than the bite when it comes to some of the tariffs. You'll have some that will be much more nastier. But when it comes to some of the exports that we see, I think it's, you're going to see carve-outs here. I don't think it's going to be as negative for tech and supply chain. That's why right now, this is a Goldilocks scenario for tech, but it's a champagne moment for Tesla investors. Dan, you can hear me well? Can you hear him? Let me give you a second. All good. All right, yeah. here's the question. Be honest with me. Can Elon Musk have an informal or formal role in the administration and be the CEO of Tesla, SpaceX, associated with Neuralink, Boring Company, etc.? cetera? Uh, yes. I think he won't clearly have a formal role from a cabinet perspective. Why not clearly? Because then it complicates in terms of his ownership and you know, I think some of the structure in terms of what we see with Tesla, with SpaceX. But I believe he'll be an unofficial whisperer I think we'll have a significant influence within the White House. And that's why this is going to be known as probably the best strategic bet that Musk ever made in terms of betting on Trump. And I think, you know, this is something that is, is just starting to play out in terms of this Trump-Musk uh, sort of alliance. Dan Ives of Wedbush, we appreciate you coming on today. Meanwhile, coming up, we speak with ARM CEO Rene Haas, host the chip designer's earnings. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology.
dive into the markets a little bit more and check out chip makers in particular. I bring you the SOX, of course, the semiconductor index. Currently up 1.6%, having a lovely couple of days. We're up more than almost 4.75, call it 5% over the last couple of trading days. Most in the green. Qualcomm just holding on to its gains. It has come down from what had been in excess of 4 or 5% higher earlier. We're up 7 tenths of a percent. They're giving a bullish sales forecast, expecting revenue of 10.5 to $11.3 billion in the current quarter. They beat analyst expectations and their profit came in better than expected as well. Moving on to ARM, which has come from what was in the red pre-market trading to a higher 3.5% now. This is they too really managed to beat out the gate when it comes to the both the top and bottom line. The company's revenue forecast was a bit of a concern, 920 million to 970 million, which perhaps just fell short of some expectations. But they really are maintaining their annual forecast of 3.8 to 4.1 billion dollars in sales. So let's get into it all a little bit more, Ed. Yeah, I think the shares are so interesting. For maybe it's a company reporting November 5th and it took time for the market to wake up and read the numbers a little bit. Who knows? The chip maker did give what was seen as a sluggish sales outlook and at first disappointed investors. What has changed? Rene Huss is the CEO of Arm and joins us now. It's really interesting, right, in the function of what Arm does on licensing royalties because sometimes it's not about unit growth. I look at like revenue, for example, and maybe some evidence, Renee, that the Chinese consumer in particular is buying higher end handsets. How does that help you benefit? Uh, well, good morning, Ed and, and Caroline. And we are uh, very happy about the quarter we just reported, uh, exceed the high end of the guidance. And our royalties uh, were at a record number. And, and to your question, you know, one of the things that we have seen a huge benefit from with our technology going forward has been our version 9, uh, which commands a much higher royalty rate than we have in the past. And what that allows us to do is not exactly track the market from a unit standpoint. Uh, one of the proof points of that, uh, unit sales for smartphones were up 4% in the last quarter. Uh, our royalties were up 40%. So you, you can get a sense that you're seeing a very big difference. That's really driven by two factors. One is version okay. 9, as I said, which commands a higher royalty rate. And second, we're just seeing more ARM technology inside these smartphones, particularly the premium segment, which also commands a higher royalty. Rene, a, a lot of investors and people that I speak to in the world of technology think you're great. You're, you're a great CEO. And you've been embarked on this sort of journey for profit and margin. But is there a ceiling to that? Like at some point, how do you keep driving those levers? Are you sort of very pricing dependent at this point? I don't think so. You know, the, the market that we're addressing is very, very large. Uh, and one of the things that has made it even larger has been all things AI. And if you think about what ARM does, we do compute, we do the CPU, every digital device has one. And the fact that you're running all these AI workloads on devices that are already running different applications that they had to in the past, that drives a need for more and more compute capacity, which ends up ending up with ARM. So as a result, we were very, very fortunate to have some tailwinds from a technology standpoint driving our growth. So as far as the ceiling, I don't think about it quite that way. Uh, but I do think where we are is a market where we just can't get enough compute capacity for all these workloads that are going to be running on every device in your, uh, in your home or your business. Meanwhile, though, perhaps some of the tension around compute and AI has been whether China's going to quote unquote beat out the United States. And that suddenly comes into a closer focus, particularly with the results of the U.S. election. Does any of that concern you, particularly around the trade and embroilment and whether that curtails the industry going forward? Yeah, a little hard to say, Caroline, relative to what what could happen from perspective of tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. I think the one thing that, uh, that I'm happy about uh, post the election on Tuesday is that here we are on Thursday morning and we have a result. Uh, we're not debating about uh, what might happen or could happen or should happen. We, we at least have a result behind us, which is good for business. It's good for the country. Now, going forward, uh, we'll just have to see uh, what uh, goes forward in terms of um, the things you mentioned. Uh, the China business for us has been uh, very resilient and very strong, uh, both in uh, data center and phones, as we've talked about, but also in the automobile sector. So regarding your question, we'll just have to wait and see. Talk to us <clears throat> a little bit about the phone part and in particular whether or not just us replacing less often but with much more expensive phones is going to be able to what makes your numbers resilient going forward will that continue to offset the fact that we're just buying fewer of them i do and and the reason for that is uh when you start thinking about all of these ai agents that will increasingly be running <clears throat> on your smartphone that is going to drive demand for more and more capability on these premium phones. Uh, and that's great for ARM 
Because if you think about a, a next generation smartphone, it still has to run games, it still has to run apps, it still has to connect to the internet. But now you want to run a large language model or small language model, and you need to interface with the cloud and do security. That all requires a lot of compute, much more than in the past, which is great for ARM because you, you can't do it without using our technology. Rene? Bloomberg reported that Arm was interested in buying some or all of Intel. What's the latest with that, please? Uh, yeah, I, I read that. I'm not sure exactly where it came from, uh, but I can't really comment on those kind of rumors. It's more recent is uh, a license dispute with Qualcomm, a longtime partner and customer of yours. Wouldn't it just make sense for you guys to work it out and settle and get something done so you can both just move forward? Yeah, so it's an ongoing litigation, as you know, Ed, and just to baseline things, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward case. Um, consent is required anytime uh, one company buys another company that has ARM technology. Uh, consent was not granted in this case, and just by way of history, uh, every contract we have has this clause, and in 35 years, I think we've done 130 uh, assignments, and 130 times uh, consent has been granted. This time it wasn't. Uh, we sent a notification uh, to Qualcomm that they were in breach of the license. Uh, we're very confident in our case, but more importantly, you know, Ed, this is about fairness. It's about equity of the ecosystem. Uh, we have lots of partners who license our technology over the last decades. We need to be fair and equitable. And we just now have a, a situation, an unprecedented one, where uh, consent was not granted. And as a result, uh, we took the action we felt we needed to take. How is it doing business? therefore, with what is a key customer, but increasingly becoming more of a frenemy? Well, you know, in terms of uh, the litigation, as I said, there's not much more I can add on to it. Um, from a financial standpoint, we've made assumptions all along uh, when we've given guidance and forecast to investors that we will not prevail in this case. So we've taken a, uh, a fairly uh, bearish uh, position on the financial outlook, uh, and that's really about, much, about all I can say on it. Rene, at the end market level and product level, what is the next phase for ARM? What's the next story that you think will carry the company forward? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Uh, you know, compute subsystems, and, and these are all about taking the pieces of IP, uh, stitching them together, together, providing them as a full end solution, which greatly saves engineering time, time to market, time to profit for our partners. That is uh, the direction of the company. We've seen amazing traction. Uh, we've had lots of design wins in the uh, data center space. Uh, MediaTek just announced their first chipset recently using ARM compute subsystems for mobile. Uh, I see that to be pervasive going forward, and it's going to allow us to not only get great benefits to the customers' markets, but those drive much higher royalties than anything we've ever done in the past, which will drive growth for us. Just paint the picture of where ARM will be in the ecosystem five, ten years from now. You're still majority held by SoftBank in terms of your outstanding shares. Massa has some big vision, $100 billion to put in in terms of creating an AI behemoth that complements what you do. But then there's also the element of whether you just stick to the designing part of the business. Where do you take this business, Rene, as a CEO? We have a lot of optionality, Caroline, in terms of the things that we do. And these are obviously the things we talk about all the time internally. Uh, which direction do we go? How horizontal do we go? How vertical do we go? Uh, I'm not able, unfortunately, to, to talk about uh, unannounced products uh, this morning with you, although I would love to, but I, <laughs> but I just can't. Uh, but Rene. we do focus very much, we do focus very much on the uh, vertical and horizontal nature of the products and also AI and the form factors and everything that goes forward. So five to 10 years ago, from five to 10 years from now, I do know that ARM will be involved in computing in a very large way. ARM um, CEO, Renee Haas, we appreciate the time today, thank you. I think AVs are gonna be a huge accelerant, actually a, you say a TAM expander, addressable market expander for, for Lyft, because I think what it's gonna do is it's gonna bring new product onto the platform that people are gonna like. Some people are gonna like being driven by a human, some people are gonna think being driven by a robot is pretty cool, some use cases favor one or the other. So anyway, I think the hybrid future is, is what we're looking at over time. Now, Mobileye, they make the sensors, they make the tech. You probably have them in your car right now. Lane assist, smart cruise control, all that stuff. That's level two. Level four is full self-driving, so imagine a world. We now go to the President of the United States, Biden, addressing the public from the Rose Garden. Let's listen in. 
Good to see this cabinet and staff together here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The, uh, it's good to see you all. Particularly good to see my granddaughter sitting in the front row here. Hi, Finn. How are you, honey? For over 200 years, America has carried on the greatest experiment in self-government in the history of the world. And that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. We're the people. The people vote and choose their own leaders, and they do it peacefully. And we're in a democracy. The will of the people always prevails. Yesterday, I spoke with President-elect Trump to congratulate him on his victory. And I assured him that I'd direct my entire administration to work with his team to ensure a peaceful and orderly transition. That's what the American people deserve. Yesterday, I also spoke with Vice President Harris. She's been a partner and a public servant. She ran an inspiring campaign, and everyone got to see something that I learned early on to respect so much, her character. She has a backbone like a ramrod. She has great character, true character. She gave her whole heart and effort, and she and her entire team should be proud of the campaign they ran. You know, the struggle for the soul of America since our very founding has always been an ongoing debate and still vital today. I know for some people, it's a time for victory, to state the obvious. For others, it's a time of loss. Campaigns are contests of competing visions. The country chooses one or the other. We accept the choice the country made. I've said many times, you can't love your country only when you win. You can't love your neighbor only when you agree. Something I hope we can do, uh, no matter who you voted for, is see each other not as adversaries, but as fellow Americans. Bring down the temperature. I also hope we can lay to rest the question about the integrity of the American electoral system. It is honest, it is fair, and it is transparent. And it can be trusted, win or lose. I also hope we can restore the respect for all our election workers who busted their necks and took risks at the outset. We should thank them. Thank them for staffing voting sites, counting the votes, protecting the very integrity of the election. Many of them are volunteers who do it simply out of love for their country. And as they did, as they did their duty as citizens, I will do my duty as president. I'll fulfill my oath, and I will honor the Constitution. On January 20th, we'll have a peaceful transfer of power here in America. To all our incredible staff, supporters, cabinet members, all the people who've been hanging out with me for the last 40 years, God love you, as my mother would say, Thank you so much. You put so much into the past four years. I know it's a difficult time. You're hurting. I hear you and I see you. But don't forget, don't forget all that we accomplished. It's been a historic presidency. Not because I'm president, because what we've done, what you've done, a presidency for all Americans. Much of the work we've done is already being felt by the American people, but the vast majority of it will not be felt we felt over the next 10 years. We have, a, we, we have legislation we passed that's just only now just really kicking in. We're going to see over a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure work done, changing people's lives in rural communities and communities that are in real difficulty because it takes time to get it done. And so much more it's going to take time, but it's there. The road ahead is clear, assuming we sustain it. There's so much, so much we can get done and will get done based the way the legislation was passed. And it's truly historic. You know, we're leaving behind the strongest economy in the world. 
I know people are still hurting, but things are changing rapidly. Together, we've changed America for the better. Now we have 74 days to finish the term, our term. Let's make every day count. That's the responsibility we have to the American people. Look, folks, you all know it in your lives. Setbacks are unavoidable, but giving up is unforgivable. Setbacks are unavoidable, but giving up is unforgivable. We all get knocked down. <clears throat> but the measure of our character, as my dad would say, is how quickly we get back up. Remember, a defeat does not mean we are defeated. We lost this battle. The America of your dreams is calling for you to get back up. That's the story of America for over 240 years and counting. It's a story for all of us, not just some of us. The American experiment endures. We're going to be OK, but we need to stay engaged. We need to keep going. And above all, we need to keep the faith. So proud to have worked with all of you. I really mean it. I sincerely mean it. God bless you all. God bless America. And may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons, who joins us from New York City. Uh, Kaylee, please, your summary of President Biden's comments. Well, Ed, the most important point about the speech from Biden at the Rose Garden in the White House that follows the speech, the concession speech from Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday, is that they both are acknowledging the decisive victory of Donald Trump and pledging for a peaceful transition of power. We just heard President Biden say those words that he called to congratulate Donald Trump yesterday, that he will do his duty on January 20th to make sure there is a peaceful inauguration of Donald Trump and a power transition in the United States. Similar in rhetoric to what we heard from Kamala Harris yesterday, the suggestion while this specific fight was lost as he cast this as campaigns being a contest between competing ideas that does not necessarily mean that there won't be ones won in the future. And interesting to also see President Biden here trying to characterize his legacy as well, talking about the accomplishments he sees this administration having completed, the idea that there's more work they will do in 74 days, because in part, this is the swan song of, song of President Biden, who is getting a lot of blame within the Democratic Party for the loss of Kamala Harris, the suggestion that he stayed in the race too long. He ultimately, of course, did not bow out of it until July, and he is getting uh, a great share of the blame uh, for what happened this week in the victory of Donald Trump. But again, that victory is being acknowledged. They are planning to work with the Trump transition team uh, to make sure that this all happens smoothly. There could still be some hiccups as uh, Donald Trump is specifically a bit skeptical of the General Services Administration, for example, the intelligence agencies that would oversee things like background checks for those incoming into the administration. So there could still be some hiccups here, but by and large, they are committing to a peaceful transfer of power. They are conceding yeah. that Donald Trump won this race, and this is something we did not see four years ago in 2020. Kaylee, they then also focus on the 74 days still left to enact policies and indeed what has been achieved. Mm, with there was a mention of infrastructure and that plays a lot to the technology community here. How much do you think there will be any more passing of anything or any more focus on, in, in, on potentially the future if indeed say a CHIPS Act is unravelled? Well that's going to be something that would be dealt with in the next Congress. Obviously there are still some re months remaining here for this administration and this uh, Congress and House of Representatives. What they're likely to deal with in the lame dunk section, uh, session which do tend to be uh, more productive as the campaign is already completed at that time really is going to surround funding as there is a funding deadline, a government funding deadline on the tw 21st of December. So they will need to make sure that the government stays funded for some period of time into the next administration first and foremost. But when the new Congress is sat and we do not yet know the entire makeup of it, yes, it will be a Republican Senate. Whether it stays a Republican House at this time is still unclear. And it would take a Republican House likely uh, to unravel any of the accomplishments of this administration legislation passed, including the CHIPS Act, but the Inflation Reduction Act as well. Bloomberg's Kayleigh Lines. We appreciate it so much on the back of that Biden speech. Meanwhile, Ed, let's get back to these markets. Yeah, and I'd like to go to crypto if that's OK, uh, because we didn't have a show 24 hours ago. But within the last 24 hours, Bitcoin has 
just got below 76,000 US dollars per token. And it's kind of weird, I'm gonna say it out loud, but that's all time high, right? I had to pull up the GP chart on my Bloomberg terminal and be like, oh, this is also happening in real time. And one of the big stories, of course, of the last 24 hours is some of the crypto related equities or stocks, companies that either are a marketplace for or have exposure to crypto. And I think the sentiment is simple, right, Caro, that uh, President elect Trump, whether from a policy perspective or his own attitude, will approach crypto differently. And largely that's been seen as supportive of that industry, even though these specific specific names aren't doing much in either direction in the moment. Boy, did they move higher yesterday, though. We appreciate it. And let, let's go to Noel Aikson, who's with us, Triple Crown Digital Partner, author of The Crypto is Macro Now, and someone who put out a great note yesterday that I paid a lot of attention to, Noel, because it was outlining what next. Yes, there's a lot of euphoria around whether indeed the SEC chair will change and be more crypto-loving or at least put in place some sort of clarity as to what the future inf- regulation will be rather than enforcement. What is next on the to-do list? What will really substantiate these record highs? That's exactly what we're all asking, Caroline. Thanks so much for having me. What is next very much depends on the priorities of the new administration when it gets in. I think we can assume that perhaps crypto is not going to be top of their list, but he did make some very important promises and it is a very sore thorn in the side of US financial infrastructure that this has not been dealt with. There's going to be some limits as to what they can do in the short term and perhaps crypto spirits are getting, getting ahead of themselves a bit, but at the very least a change of regime at the SEC would be very good news to enable so in builders to go in and talk to the regulator without fear of an action. This would especially be good for assets whose status okay. as a security or not is currently unclear, as well as those that want to provide services for those assets. Noel, do you have a good sense of where President-elect Trump will start? Any specific area of focus? I think the number one and the the low-hanging fruit has to be a change at the SEC. I think that's pretty much on the cards. That would have happened, to be fair, I think, anyways. But the type of change now, obviously, is going to be slightly different than had the election gone the other way. That's a fairly easy one. And again, you have to remember, ever since Chevron was overturned, the SEC does have its hands tied as to the kind of rulemaking it can engage in. But just removing the fear of action is a very big deal. Then you articulate in the note that maybe we look at stablecoin um, focus and indeed some sort of clarity on it going forward. We're also, though, thinking about what Congress looks like. There are a lot of people, a lot of races that were backed by an awful lot of money coming from the crypto community that wanted to see, well, more change from a congressional perspective. Senator Cynthia Loomis, she goes on to talk about the strategic Bitcoin reserve that many of us really wonder how powerful that will really be. What do you make of that particular part of the promise from Trump? I'm hearing a lot of chatter about that. A lot of people, everyone's asking when, not if, but when is this going to happen? I, to be honest, I, I'm skeptical we're going to get one of those. And to be honest, I also think that Trump himself might walk back his promise on that when he realizes that it involves selling dollars to buy Bitcoin. Even if he doesn't, it will be very hard to get through Congress. But to be honest, that isn't the most important thing. It would be just enough. It would be good news for the market if the U.S. decides to not sell its current stash. And as for the stable coins that you're asking about, that, again, is low-hanging fruit. A stable coin bill is bipartisan. It's a question of ironing out the details, what kind of requirements and reserves would they insist on. That's going to be pretty easy, and I think we're going to get that pretty much right out of the bat as well, well depending on how fast Congress moves, of course. And we do, as you, as you said, Caroline, we do have the most crypto-friendly Congress ever. That is really quite astonishing. What is really needed, though, is a crypto right. bill that will recognize that the definitions have changed, that new types of rules are needed, that is going to be more complicated. Noel Aitchison, we're going to be getting you back then. Triple Crown Digital Partner, we thank you. Coming up, we're going to be speaking with Palmer Lucky, Andrew founder, as President Trump heads back to the White House and questions linger around his defense tech stance. We discuss President-elect Trump, the Simply Meg technology.
As Donald Trump prepares to head back to the White House, there are questions around his policies on AI, defense tech, and spending. For more, Andrew founder Palmer Lucky is back with us here on Bloomberg Technology. And Palmer, I, I want to keep it focused on technology, but, but I'd also like to invite you to start just to give your reaction to the outcome of the election and I guess reflect your sentiments about the next four years. Well, I think it was obvious to most people who have been paying attention to what people are paying attention to. I know that that's contentious. A lot of people thought it was going to be close. I didn't think it was. Of course, I'm biased. I've been a Trump supporter for a long time. I supported him in 2016. I supported him in 2020. I actually wrote a letter to him while I was in college uh, in 2011 telling him that he shouldn't run for president. So I've been, a, I've been a fan of the master of the art of the deal for a long time. It's nice to see it finally culminate. I'm also a big fan of his pick in J.D. Vance for vice president. He's done an incredible job. Everyone else has got to see that. Uh, but I've known JD for a while, and uh, he's he's an incredible incredible person. Um, but my my reaction on kind of the more business side, the defense side, is it's great to Thanks. have someone inbound who is deeply, I guess, uh, deeply aligned with the idea that we need to be spending less on defense while still getting more, that we need to do a better job of procuring the defense tools that protect our country. Trump famously got involved in the nitty gritty of some of our aircraft carrier design and some of the procurement of Air Force One. To see that level of involvement from a president is pretty rare and I think an indicator of his priorities. You wrote a letter to the guy back in 2011. Who knows whether that inspired his run, Palmer, but I, you're close, I, of course, with the, the VP elect as well. Are you talking about anyone to be the defense secretary? Have you got anyone's ear? Would you like anyone in particular? Look, I've got opinions. I'm in touch with the transition of team, of course, and I know a lot of people who are involved with the transition have known them for a long time in many cases. Uh, I've heard a few names thrown around for a potential secretary of defense, but also for the many roles that are in, uh, you know, maybe not the secretary level. They don't get quite as discussed on shows like yours, but still very, very important what roles. What names? In how we so you know what? I don't want to throw any names out there because I would be sure. happy with all. Of them. There's not there's not a single name that I'm heard that I'm unhappy with. And I have to I have I have to play nice and uh, and not a uh, not 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 say, oh, well, I would prefer this guy or that guy. All of the names that I've seen are people who do an incredible job. Thank you, Palmer. Um, Andrew has spent uh, years working with the Department of Defense as Right. And, and I don't want you to reflect too much on the experience that has been, but maybe you could talk us through the changes you think are needed in that department structurally in terms of how government does business with private enterprise like Anderil. Sure. Look, I got into the defense space after you know, I sold my first company, Oculus, to Facebook for a few billion dollars, was working on VR there for a few years before I got fired. And the reason I got into national security is because I wanted to save taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars a year by making tens of billions of dollars a year. And I think that that can be done by encouraging the creation of defense product companies that use their own money to decide what to build, how to build it when it's done, and then have skin in the game. When they fail, they lose money. When they succeed, they make money. I think the set of incentives that you see in a lot of defense contracting today, defense procurement today, uh, it cost plus contracting, where you're paid for your fixed time and materials and then a fixed percentage of profit on top, it rewards exactly the wrong things. You make more money by making things more expensive. You make more plus by having more cost. And that manifests in the form of programs that go too long, programs that are too expensive, components that are more expensive than need be because it's really the only way to make more money on it. In fact, in some okay. cases, they make more money with things that break frequently than not. And so I think what, what we really need is companies that are aligned with the way that we do business in the rest of our economy. You build a good product, you sell it, you make money. So in terms of contracting, if we see a shakeup, will you benefit? Will smaller, the startups benefit a little bit more than they have been? Who are the winners? Who are the losers, do you think, Palmer? Well, I think the winners are going to be uh, particularly uh, two, two things. I think it's going to be a lot of these new startups that are springing up in the wake of Andrew's success. I often say that other defense startups have raised a lot more money off my success than I have, which I'm fine with. And I've raised billions, but I've seen their pitch decks. They're saying, hey, Anderl did it. The DOD is moving with this. People understand that this is a viable business model. I think another beneficiary is going to be companies that have been around for a long time that are very, very competent, that know how to get things done, that know how to write a budget, that know how to build a team, that know how to build a product. The companies that suffer are going to be the ones that try to shunt responsibility for their failures over and over and over again onto the tax 
taxpayer. I think they're the ones who are going to struggle. And I don't want to make this sound like this is just a, tr- a this is just a Trump thing. This is a nonpartisan idea. I mean, Andrew has been around for about eight years now. We did well under Trump in his first administration, and we did even better under Biden in his administration. I think we're going to do even better now. It's uh, the okay. defense space is one of the few that is, I think, actually successfully remained pretty nonpartisan, and that's aligned with Anderl too. You know, I'm a Republican, obviously I'm the founder of Anderl, but our CEO, Brian Schimpf is a Democrat. He's fundraised for right. Kamala. He's done fundraisers for other Democrat politicians. The idea that the United States military should have the strongest military in the world and that we should defend our allies around the world, not just with our military, but especially giving them the tools that they need to defend themselves. It, it's a, it's a pretty nonpartisan idea. Palmer has the election of Donald Trump caused Anderl to adjust or change planning for China and allies like Taiwan? Uh, I don't think so. Mostly because I was certain he was going to win. I think it was already baked in. Okay, and one thing I'm fascinated by, and just bear with me on this one. Elon Musk, okay. There's an association between the two. The great unknown is whether Musk will hold a formal or informal role in some government department. But I guess, what's your assumption and planning on how much attention he can keep Trump focused on defense, space, and what you kind of think it will actually lead to? Do you see what I mean? I think that Elon has outperformed every reasonable expectation of him. I was one of the people, I have to admit, that didn't believe that he could successfully work on Twitter and SpaceX and Tesla and Solar City and Neuralink and politics and everything else and Diablo 4 top 20 <laughs> ranked all at the same time. It was but he's done it. And so uh, I, on the one hand, it's easy to say, oh, man, I think it's going to be really hard for him to do all of that. And also, you know, keep this administration, maybe focused on things like space, making humanity and multiplanetary species and extra solar species eventually. Uh, but you know what? Everyone who's ever bet against Elon has come away crying. So I, I, I think I'm probably just going to have to say, yeah, I bet he's going to do it somehow. Somehow he's going to do it. Andrew founder, Palmer Lucky. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Let's get to today's Tech Daily. Elon Musk's big bet on Donald Trump has paid off. If you're looking at the market capitalization of Tesla, absolutely rocketing. But what does it mean for the value of other areas of his control? X, for example, the platform formerly known as Twitter. Bloomberg's Max Chafkin discusses what has been a massive payoff if you think of 130 million in and however much his wealth has ballooned by that. But what about the other areas of growth? Well, I think X we need to stop thinking about as a business that exists outside of Elon Musk's, um, you know, general empire. You know, X's value has fallen a lot over the past two years. But I think you, I think at this point, it's it's fair to say that its influence, its political worth, um, what it gives Elon Musk's other areas is probably worth more than the 44 billion dollars he paid for it, or at least the money that he's lost in in running it over the past two years. SpaceX stands to gain tremendous. Uh, from from this uh, election. You know, Trump on the stump was talking about Mars programs, talking about ordering rockets up from Elon. And and if that happens, if there is a a big Mars program that is unveiled, that's going to be worth billions, if not tens of billions of dollars to Elon Musk. Neuralink, his, uh, you know, brain implant thing, uh, that's federally regulated. The Boring Company, federally regulated. Uh, AI, potentially regulated. Federally federally regulated is like the key point, right? You know, in history, high profile people from the private sector going to government is not new, like Gary Cohn, um, Mnuchin, whatever. The question is, will Musk see it through, Max? Will he still be with Trump in some role a year from now or two or three years from now? Well, I think and I think the comparison with folks like Gary Cohn is instructive. You know, there were lots of business people who during the last uh, Trump presidency kind of navigated themselves towards Trump and ultimately, I think, had a not great experience. You know, this is a guy who takes up a lot of space in the room. He is, you know, famously uh, strong headed. uh, And and you look at Elon Musk's personality and Donald Trump's personality, you might say, how can these two men be in a room together? Now, the the point I would what I would point out is 
that Elon Musk is way richer than any of those guys you mentioned and way more powerful and has a real personal brand, a celebrity. He is as famous as some of the most famous people in the world. So he has leverage over Trump that maybe some of these other business people did not have. Um, Elon Musk now, I think, very much needs Donald Trump, but I would argue that Donald Trump and the Republican Party now needs Elon Musk, too. There are other positions of power within the U.S. government. The White House is not all of it. Will there be checks and balances? I mean, I think you have to look at the past Trump presidency and also just like the character of Elon Musk uh, and Donald Trump. These are not guys who like following the, who, who necessarily are paying super close attention to the rules. And, I, and so I think that, you know, yeah, we're going to see a lot of conversation about potential ethics violations. Should a guy who owns a major defense contractor, or controls a major defense contractor, be giving the U.S. government advice on d defense personnel? Um, that's probably going to run afoul of, of ethics rules. Now, do I expect that to right. slow down Elon Musk? No. I mean, to be fair, Palmer Lucky was just on the show, and he's a major defense contractor, and he was giving loads of advice to the future administration. So, okay, but there's we'll a huge going. difference between no, no. giving advice and and being part of the White House, right? That, that's I know that's there the is, and, and it's the only question: formal role or informal role? And I promise you, I'll try and find out. Bloomer's Max Chafkin. Thank you very much, Karen. That is it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Boy, do we get through a lot, whether it's earnings that are still on, a Fed that's to come, but also about the election. Check out the pod. You know where to find it. Team in New York and SF, thank you. This is Bloomberg.